We are with Justin Richards from Share the Tea Travel, and you're on Well Traveled Life with Jonathan and Jennifer. We're going to talk about Justin's life as a tour guide, places we want to go, the travels that we've loved, and the upcoming trips we've got planned. What's really fun about this is we know you from Scotland, you're from Scotland, but you're in Texas. Yeah, my first time to Texas. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time in Arizona, used to live there, uh, and New York, but never Texas. First time to the Lone Star State. A little quick background. We know Justin, our very first trip to Scotland together. We were going to, I guess it was Queens Ferry. Yes. And we hired Justin as our guide through, was that Airbnb experience? It was, yeah. yeah. We hired Justin as our guide, and we had been talking online for uh, probably a month or so beforehand. And I just said, you take us where you want us to go. Where'd you take us? Oh, goodness. Well, uh, we tried to get into Dunfermline Abbey, but it was closed. Yes. Uh, where Robert the Bruce is buried. Um, and then we went to the Fife Coast, St. Andrews, and um, Instra, and some of the small fishing villages there, and had a great fish and chips. Yeah. Why uh, Instra? They have some of the best fish and chips in Scotland um, at the fish bar there. So you were my very first guest ever on any tour. I don't know if you knew that. I don't think we knew that. No, yes. Yeah, you wrote the very first review I ever had. Um, so you're kind of responsible. Um, I think I was a wee bit nervous, actually. Were you really? Well, in a way, because I had an idea of, in my head of I wanted to take you to some of my favorite places. Um, but I was also conscious we had to get back to Queen's Ferry so you don't miss the boat um, or the ship, I guess. It's a yeah, ship, isn't it? It is. They like um, to call them ships. Yeah. Stood out. We got into the car and you had a car at that time that you would yeah. hire out. Yes. So it's almost like Airbnb for cars. Yeah, it was. And then I, I was like, I need to get a bigger car because I started getting more bookings. And so now I have a seven seater. I remember we spotted the Highland Cow. You spotted it on your way oh. to pick us up. And yes. so the first thing he says to us is, oh, and I know just where to take you to see a Highland Cow just around the corner. <laughs> and he stops and there they were like right in front of us. Yeah. It was awesome. Because they're a bit elusive. I don't know if I've seen any there since. Based entirely on our day with Justin, we had scheduled our next summer big trip. We had four months and we said, you know, what are we going to do with our four months? We spent a month of it in Norway. We did a month in Scotland and then we did a month in England and we did a month uh, doing a cruise across the Atlantic and coming home. But that month in Scotland was 100% because of you. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You loved your country so much. I do. I, I care a lot about Scotland. Um, and um, no, I'm so glad you got to come back. But because of your review, I was quite busy at that time as well. So I'm so sorry I didn't get to see you as much as I wanted to. Showing you around Glasgow where um, I've lived longer than anywhere else in Scotland. It's a place that's very special to me. Why is Glasgow special? Because you don't live there now. No, I live in Edinburgh now. Um, Mostly because it's also a good base to do tours from, but even before I was doing the tours, I had moved across to Edinburgh. I love Edinburgh, don't get me wrong, it's an amazing city, but the city slogan of Glasgow is people make Glasgow, and I think that that's true. You know, uh, most of my um, really close friends are still there, the food scene is amazing, the energy, the vibe, the atmosphere, but it's often a place that people miss out if they're visiting Scotland, um, which I think is a bit unfair because it's a great city and a place I, with a big uh, heart for social justice, a place I care a lot about. And I don't get there as often as I'd like to. When I first started running itineraries by you, I didn't have Glasgow in the itinerary. And you said to me, you're not going to Glasgow? <laughs> and I said, uh, it's not on the itinerary, but I couldn't. And, and that's when you said, I will meet you there. I will tour Glasgow with you. You have to go to Glasgow. It's my favorite city. Oh, yeah, and there were the two big events on. There was the World um, Piping Championships, which are in Glasgow um, in August every year. And there was also the Cycle Championships. I started my, um, my tours, Share the T, I'm called. The letter T, it stands for tours, travel, local tips, because we're sharing all that. And of course, we stopped for a cup of tea, because yeah. I love tea. And at the coffee, as you found out. <laughs> but tea as well. I probably get about... 50% of my bookings through my own website, but I am Airbnb because, partially because of the lovely review you wrote. Um, it's really taken off as well. So I've had, um, you know, probably a couple hundred people through Airbnb and I still um, do that now. Um, I'm on a number of other websites um, with locals, Viator, Get Your Guide, um, Airbnb, my own. So it, it's a bit of a mix. Um, the bookings come from different, uh, um, different places and also word of mouth. From a tour guide perspective, what mm. is your favorite platform? 
Airbnb is one of the better ones. Um, all of the platforms take a bit of a hefty commission, but Airbnb is actually the least, and they also um, insure you and have really, well, I've only had to deal with their customer service twice, and both times I was quite happy with how it was handled. But often you'll see if guides are on multiple platforms that the prices are different on them, and that has to do with the amount of commission that's paid, uh, which a lot of people aren't always aware of. So it's always better to book direct if you can. And I will say pro tip from my end, so I will look at sites like Viator or mm -hmm. Get Your Guide or Tours with Locals, those kinds of things. I will look at those to get an idea of what's out there in a town. And then I go direct and I'll start Googling. So if I see slow food in Scotland or I see private tour in Scotland, I will then Google private tour in Scotland and see what comes up and I will mm -hmm. try and book direct. One thing I noticed on your site though, I couldn't book direct with you on your site. I had to call you to do yeah. a direct booking. Yeah, and um, that's something that I'm working on in the future, but um, it's a bit tricky because some people want um, multi-day trips, for example, yeah. so the availability can kind of fluctuate. Um, if it's a day trip, if it's a multi-day trip, goodness, I have a 10-day trip coming up this year. So yeah, just for the best availability and in case people's dates are flexible, I just have them contact me. and. If I can't provide a tour, I could recommend other reputable companies as well and to friends of mine that are doing tours. You do a lot in Scotland. You're yes. Scottish, right? Yeah. But And I also know that a lot of the people that book with you, it's their first time to Scotland. Yeah, and sometimes their first time to Europe. Okay. Um, you know, for quite a lot of the visitors that we have from the US in particular, it's their first time ever abroad. And it's quite an honor to be able to share that experience with them. I'm always aware what a privilege it is to be part of people's holidays, you know, yeah. and, um, and vacations. But um, for a lot of my guests, it's their very first time ever internationally, or certainly to Europe. And it's quite an honor that they've picked Scotland, um, you know, so that's, um, that's, that's quite magical. So um, it's really good to be able to share the experience with them, chat to them about um, maybe some of the things they expected versus the reality and, um, and where they're thinking about going next. Because usually I think if you get bit by the travel bug, you want to, you know, keep going and exploring. Yeah. When you picked the towns that you picked for us, um, mm -hmm. one of the things he didn't know, he picked Einstra because of the fish and chips. I don't eat fish and chips. I don't like fish. And so it was hard for me to get excited about that. But he kept talking about this is the best fish and chips in the country. And it was. We were in Heathrow Airport on a layover talking to some folks, super, super Western Scottish, very Gaelic, spoke Gaelic uh, oh. predominantly. And we told them that we had been to the best fish and chips in the country. And they said, aye, there's only one of those. It's an Einstra. Yes, yes. <laughs> you were proven right. Oh, that's great. I mean, the Einstra fish bar um, is, is amazing. I am, yeah, I also love the real food cafe in Tyndrum, and there's a few others that I really like. But um, whenever I would go to St. Andrews with friends, um, you, that's one place that we would stop. There's a kind of a, a few musts that you have to do, um, even if you're local, when you go to Fife, which is that part of Scotland. We call it the East Nuke of Fife. Um, Nuke is almost like a wee corner, um, and it's a bit that juts out almost like a wee peninsula where St. Andrews is. Um, but there's some lovely fishing villages there, Crail, beautiful. Um, there's a really good um, coffee house there where the um, they, they have their pastries made by the retired um, patisserie chef at the Dorchester Hotel. Amazing. I don't know if they advertise that fact, but um, the pastries are amazing. Uh, St. Andrews, you have the Fisher and Donaldson Bakery with the fudge donuts. Yes. Um, and uh, Janetta's Gelateria, two real staples in St. Andrews. Um, also some really nice pubs and, and cafes. And then, of course, um, you have the fish bar and then Insta. The place that no one can ever say. Um, often people, um, there's there's a few places in Fife. Um, one is Kudis, but it's spelled Col Ross. And every, you know, even even folks from from Glasgow, you know, they didn't know it's Kudis. If you're from um, Fife, you would know that. Which I'm not from Fife, obviously, but uh, yeah, and um, and uh, an Einster, um, which is some people will call it Anstruther because that's how it's spelled. But I think the local people, that's how they they would say it is Einster. Einster. So it's a 
Yeah, things don't always look like how they're spelled. <laughs> That's for sure true. You have this fascinating background, and I think it was one of the things that intrigued us when we first met you. Oh, I mean, I love Scotland, <laughs> and I love traveling and meeting new people. Um, and obviously, you know, based in Scotland, we have a great, we have a number of great airports with really reasonable flights. We're also near the sea. It's very easy to travel around. So I was able to travel all over Europe. Um, I spent a lot of time in Australia. I lived in Melbourne for a year. Um, I spent a lot of time um, uh, in in America. In Arizona in New York and um, you know I yeah uh, so most of my childhood was in certainly Arizona uh, mm -hmm. so yeah I you went to high school in Chandler Arizona I did and uh, I did and so there's a lot of places that are really special to me um, I have spent a lot of time in Italy um, where my um, where my parents live now so yeah it's uh, it's it's really amazing to have these opportunities and um, and to be able to live in different countries and to to travel around and, and get to get to know people. I always tried to make one new friend in every place. So then you have a, a, a reason to go back, you have a connection with somewhere. I think that's quite special. So I, I always hope that when people come on a tour that they feel that they have a friend in Scotland. That's uh, one of my goals. That's uh, very much how we felt. Oh, well you do. <laughs> well, you have a friend in Texas. I do. <laughs> Hence why I'm here. <laughs> we met you and we were so impressed by your international background, but we obviously knew you as our Scottish tour guide. Mm. But as we were talking to you over the year, you were doing tours all over the place. So yeah. talk a little bit about the tours you do outside of Scotland. Yeah, so um, I offered a few tours um, in Scotland and a lot of people coming kind of, particularly from the US would combine it with either Scotland and Ireland or Ireland is another place that's quite dear to me and um, and a place I love going. So um, so it was, it was quite fun doing Scotland and Ireland together. And then um, Scotland and England, a lot of people that fly out of Heathrow. They wanted um, uh, to be driven from Edinburgh to London, maybe over four or five days with stops along the way. So that kind of developed. Um, I also have organized um, trips uh, in, in Greece and, and Italy, which were really, really good. Um, so I have a really good friend who's a, a, a tour guide in Greece. And so it's, it's fun to think about and collaborate on these um, uh, tours outside Scotland. Uh, Europe is, uh, is uh, being based there is a place that I care very much about and, and love. And I've been very fortunate to travel to every country in Europe except Belarus and Moldova. Um, so they'll have to wait for now, of course. Yeah. But, uh, you know, um, it, it, it's really great to be able to um, to offer tours elsewhere. One that I really enjoyed was taking guests that I had in Scotland um, to um, Central and Eastern Europe and spending time with their um, relatives in Slovakia. That was amazing. And, and becoming part of their adopted family for the week. It's been really great to, to have these experiences and to share the knowledge I have of travel in Europe with others. And uh, I'm a big foodie and a big history lover. So those are my two areas of expertise. So when I put a, together a tour, I'm like, we need to, you know, learn about this. We need to try these foods. And so that's, uh, that's a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, the, the ones I've done are mostly East and Central Europe. Also the Christmas market tour. Each country kind of has a different take on a Christmas market. Very festive, the smells, the food, um, the, the little crafts and just the, the festive atmosphere is something I really uh, love um, showing people. And you're planning a Christmas market tour. Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. Um, the first week of December uh, this year. We're going. Oh, it's going to be amazing. How do you do your tours? I'd like to take maybe six people maximum in a nine-seater uh, vehicle. And that gives us the ability to travel around easily. Um, I have done one before where we went by rail, um, but um, just with the luggage and everything, it's nice to have your own kind of vehicle for that. So and who does the driving? Me. I love to drive, um, absolutely love it. And I could drive on both sides of the road, so, um, so that's not a problem. Uh, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, Glasgow or Naples or, um, or uh, right. Bratislava, I could figure it out. <laughs> right. so, um, so I like to do the driving. Over the years, I have gone with friends, with family to different Christmas markets around Europe to kind of find my favorite ones. Uh, I mean, in many European countries, every city, every village in some countries like Germany will have their own markets. So I haven't seen them all, but I have had quite a few that I like and I like to share those with people. And also every year I try to discover one or two new ones for me um, just to keep in my mind uh, for the future. So can you give us a hint? Where do you think we might be headed? Oh, well, one of my favorite places is Wrocław in Poland. Um, it's great because um, 
they have a really good food, a lot of local Polish food. And um, I think the last time I was there was, uh, well, I was there in January this year, which was funny because it was after Christmas. So I had the market to myself. Um, but they had, I think, 15 different types of mulled wine, different flavors. They had a cherry one I really loved. So I like that one. There's a particular smoked cheese from Poland, South Poland, that's really good. Uh, and a lot of Polish arts and crafts. So it has a very local feeling and it wasn't that touristic. Wrocław is also one of my favorite places in Europe to visit. Um, so we definitely have to go there. Bratislava, Slovakia's capital. Uh, Slovakia is a country I've spent a lot of time in and I really enjoy going to. Um, and maybe Prague, um, although it's a bit busier, a bit um, more visited, it's a beautiful city, beautiful market, um, amazing food. Czech people are some of the nicest people I've ever met. So um, we'll be going to those um, uh, places for sure and others along the way. It'll be fun. I can't wait. I can't wait. It's going to be so much fun. And so the way we're doing this is Justin's doing the driving and coming up with the itinerary. And I'm going to help find our lodging so that we have oh. really cool Airbnbs where we can all stay together. So oh, it's going to be it's fantastic. It's going to be so fun. <laughs> yeah. And we'll get a bit of um, a, a bit of history of the cities as well. Um, some of the market highlights, free time to explore at your own pace. Uh, and uh, yeah, e even encountering some local people as well along the way. So I would be remiss if I didn't say that your knowledge of history is, I'm married to a historian and your knowledge of history perhaps outdoes Jonathan's no. at times. No, do you think so? I don't, I, I, no, surely not. The, your, your ability to storytell on the go, on the fly, and there, there is really, as we have toured with you and, and we've, so you know, we did Glasgow as sort of a tour. We did the area around Edinburgh as sort of a tour. And then we met as just buds. He came and stayed with us in Luss oh. in the Trossa National Forest on Loch Lomond and mm. took us for a day in Inverary. Rest and be thankful. That's a beautiful lookout though, with an interesting history too. Being part of the old military road that allowed the British military into the Highlands to crush any rebellion and militarize Scotland. What that. is your background that you have all of this history? I was always interested in history, you know, my whole life. And it's something I still like learning about. I mean, every country in Europe has such a long history, it's impossible to know everything, you know. So sometimes um, before a trip, I'll need to research it if it's a country I'm less familiar with, uh, Slovakia being an example of that, or Hungary because each goodness I mean when you talk about France about Spain about um, Scotland England each country has such a long rich history and so many different perspectives and viewpoints um, that uh, you know it's it's difficult to know everything but I always love to learn but um, Scottish history is is, is is my specialty and uh, I was a teacher for a number of years uh, so I was able to teach history social studies um, world religions philosophy a number of different subjects both in the UK and in Australia so um, history is something I'm very passionate about. I mean, if you look at um, Scotland, uh, discourse has always been a part of our culture. The Scottish Enlightenment um, was, a, was, you know, really profoundly impacted the way that we, um, you know, view, view discussions, debates, the world really. So this idea of, of debate, discussion, looking at different viewpoints, it is something that is embedded in our curriculum in Scotland. And uh, yeah, I, I, I like that because we have so many different sides of stories. Uh, we have so many different viewpoints on history, particularly in Scotland um, and many countries in Europe where um, there might be contentious issues or division. People will have very vastly different perspectives. And as an educator, when I was a teacher, you know, you have to um, explain these in a very non-biased way about the different perspectives and coming to your own conclusions and uh, yeah I think that's something that really stems from this the um, the enlightenment and even before then this idea of discourse and um, it's always been something that's been very important in Scottish culture yeah yeah it is my favorite part of conversation oh. with you yeah <laughs> I loved agreeing to disagree um, I mean, yeah, and just looking at things from different perspectives. Uh, I mean, even when I was a teacher, sometimes kids would say, would say something and it would get me to change my view on something. So, you know, my mind's always open to be changed. Um, so, yeah, I think, yeah, argument is always a good thing. Um, respectful argument, probably, I would say. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. No, I really enjoy that. Favorite topics to talk about for us have been Scottish independence, mm -hmm. Brexit, how frustrating or hard for you is that when your tour clients want to have those difficult discussions? I always try to give a few different um, perspectives on that. Um, and I, you know, if I'm sharing my own personal opinion, I'll make that clear that, you know, this is what I think and how it's affected me. But this is what other people would think um, because 
Well, I would say in Scotland, Brexit, I, I don't think there's very many people in favour of it at all. Um, I think that by far the minority. Independence is just about 50-50, so you can ask two different Scots what their views are and you'll get two different perspectives. And I, if they ask me about it, I'll explain my view on it, but I'll also kind of explain why people might see that issue differently. I think it's important to discuss um, these kind of issues and the different perspectives um, with them. And it is, a, it is a part of our history in Scotland, um, our connections to Europe, our, um, our independence and, and, and later lack thereof, um, you know, have, have profoundly shaped us. So um, there's, yeah, it all kind of fits together. When I'm on a tour, I like to kind of tell a story from Scotland's early days um, through the medieval ages um, and, and up to the present day. And a lot of the themes throughout our history um, remain the same. Our, um, our historic attachment to Europe and European countries, um, you know, fighting for our independence. And like I say, people will have different views on that now. Um, but there are some very, our, our distinct cultural identity, um, you know, there's, but also the things that we have in common with the rest of the UK um, and the things that are very different and have remained so. So there's, a, there's common threads throughout our history. And I love to kind of weave them together into a story um, on the tours that yeah. we have. As somebody who might be new to Scotland mm. and looking to make sure that they understand what they're walking into, what would you want them to know about Scotland before they arrive? Scotland is a very welcoming place, a very safe place generally. Uh, you know, it's a place where um, people love to uh, love love to chat. Uh, people will have strong views on things, um, but. Um, you know, I think Scottish people are some of the nicest people in the world. Maybe I'm a bit biased because I live there, but um, people are very kind, very open. Um, the questions I usually get from people, um, some of the questions that I've seen, you know, it could be things like, do we have refrigerators? Do we have ketchup? Basic things. And I'm like, we're not like a, a, a third world country. Like, you know, in many cases, Scots um, invented many of the things we have in the modern world today. Yeah. So I think that's quite funny. So um, we do have those things. Um, the weather is always changeable. There's not a good, the best time to visit or anything like that. Um, so packed for all the seasons. Do tourists go to Scotland in the winter? Increasingly, yeah. The year-round tourism is something that's really developed. I think winter can be very beautiful. The weather, I mean, obviously isn't as good as in the summer. You have shorter days, you have a lot more um, rain. But if you get a really clear winter's night, the views of the stars, sometimes you could see the northern lights um, if you don't have cloud cover. Uh, it's incredible. Um, it's less busy. You could have places to yourself. So yeah, I've done quite a few tours this year, even in January, where before I you know, hadn't really done that. But the tourism to Scotland's really increased. We have one fifth of the visitor numbers that Ireland has, but they are on the rise. Um, you know, there's the popularity of Outlander, um, people yeah. tracing their Scottish ancestry, a lot of different reasons for people to come um, to Scotland. We uh, heard a lot of Harry Potter this and Harry Potter Harry that. Harry Potter, too. yeah, uh, that's, a, that's something that's been around a long time now and um, has worldwide appeal. They filmed a lot of things there. Um, in Scotland um, and uh, the author lived in Edinburgh so I'd say the Harry Potter connection is still very real for people outlander for people particularly from the US um, we don't really have it actually in Scotland it's not well known at all but it's made people talk about Scottish history about the Jacobites um, yes. about um, that particular era in our history in the 1740s have you read outlander books or have you watched the show I haven't I've watched bits of it and I've, I know the synopsis and yeah. having done outlander tours and, and having a lot of <laughs> outlander fans although the author is American she did research a lot of Scottish history it does fit together really well into what actually happened yeah. um, so yeah so I, I don't think that we, we, we so mind Jamie and Claire are real? No, they're not real. They're fictional. That's something that I would also be aware of. If you touch standing stones, you're not going to be transported to the 1700s, most likely. I mean, it's never happened to me. I don't think I would want to be transported to the 1700s. I don't 1700s. think I would either. No. Yeah. Oh, it Unless been there's a Jamie waiting on the <laughs> Maybe. But uh, I don't know. I think it would have just been a a pretty dreadful time for a, a yeah. lot of reasons. Um, a lot of blood, a lot of death, a lot of poor hygiene. It wouldn't have been great, let's be honest. You know, I think that was the other thing I I really realized with our first day with you, the, the rather brutal history that Scotland has. Yeah. And whether it was the Highland clearings or it was the clan wars, uh, it, 
there, there's a lot of brutality. In probably every country in Europe probably has this um, to some extent. Um, you know, uh, I know certainly in, in Spain and France and, and, and many Eastern mm -hmm. Central European countries, um, you know, Russia, um, Slovakia, um, Czech, Czechia, they would also have similar kind of things. But yeah, in Scotland, yeah, it is part of our history, isn't it? Um, the Highland Clearances, the Wars of Independence. Um, yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of bloodshed in our in our past. In the Highlands, you had um, yeah um, interfighting between different clans. Um, historically, um, but uh, yeah, although we had many different cultures always inhabit Scotland, you know, we we all have kind of one identity as as, as Scots now, and very inclusive, which is something else I really like. Having the knowledge of of, of European travel, although um, I love doing the tours of Scotland um, and the rest of the UK and Ireland, um, yeah, I, I, I always love uh, going abroad too. To uh, you know, uh, part of my family live in Italy, so it's a place that uh, is, is quite dear to me as well, and a place that I know really well. So I try to take people to to places I like to go that are off the beaten track that people might not know so much about. Um, and I think that's really important. But no, I, I would say um, with uh, with Share the Tea, although we're based in Scotland and most of our tours are in Scotland, Ireland and the rest of the UK, um, every year, you know, I like to do something um, a bit different, a tour in Greece, a tour in Italy. Collaborating with local people, because I think it's really important to support local small businesses and um, engage with local guides who know their history yeah. and have lived it. Um, I think that's really important. Um, but uh, yeah, always up for an adventure. So um, if you're thinking about coming to Scotland or elsewhere in Europe, um, it'd be great to, to hear from anyone. That'd be yeah, fantastic. That would be fun. <laughs> we will link Justin's website in the description and we will tag him in this video. So oh, thank that you. they can get directly <laughs> to you and not have to go through one of the platforms if they don't need to. Sure, yeah, you know, and um, we love creating custom itineraries for people. If there's a particular area of Scotland um, you want to see, I love to set up um, even phone calls with people to find out their interests and uh, and put together an itinerary that's customized and, and perfect for them. I did my own itinerary and I sent it to Justin and he says, what? No Glasgow. <laughs> you need more time in Sky. Yeah. Why are you going to Fort William? <laughs> and then, so I redid my whole itinerary, send it back to him. And he says, what? No Edinburgh? <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't make it there that trip. We did. You know, we do hold the world's biggest art festival in August in Edinburgh, the Fringe. It's amazing. It's well worth seeing if you're interested in big festivals and comedy and the arts. If you want to visit Edinburgh for Edinburgh, it's probably the worst time to go. Um, right. But um, I would say there's never a bad time to visit Scotland. Um, there's something for everybody at all times of the year. Yeah. We would agree. We're headed back. You no, know, it'll be fantastic to have you back. I yep. can't wait. It'll be fun. Okay, foodie Scotland. So we talked okay. about the fish and chips. Yes. What else do people? It's whiskey, right? Whiskey, yes. But I mean, gin. Gin is a huge thing. Yeah, the craft, the craft gin industry movement is a big deal. Um, I mean, gin and tonic is one of my favorite drinks. If I'm going to drink something, the gin, the whiskey, um, the craft beer. Uh, you know, we have a bit of everything. Um, so, but but whiskeys are are kind of bread and butter, really. Scotland, isn't it? But food wise, mm. we had some phenomenally good food in Scotland. And you brought something to us this time that I'm, I have not tried it yet. So I can't vouch yet, but he described it as shortbread crack. Yeah, basically like it's the best shortbread in the world. It's, and it is addictive. Um, so I think you'll really enjoy that. Uh, I mean, shortbread itself has just three ingredients normally, flour, butter, and sugar. sugar. 642, um, as, uh, as, as folks used to say. I think it was six parts flour, four parts butter, two parts sugar. I think I've got that right. But yeah, delicious. Um, scones, you have to have a scone. Um, I mean, uh, there's some amazing uh, cafes and bakeries for scones that I just love. Haggis. Um, a lot of people are scared to try haggis, but it's basically a spicy lamb sausage. And if you've had a hot dog, what's in a haggis is better than what's in a hot dog. Yeah. So I've never had people try haggis and, and hate it. So if they're a bit leery, I always order a little bit on some of the tours if they're up for trying it, um, just to just to try. And everybody's loved it. Haggis is delicious. Um, love it. I have uh, to tell you, he brought us haggis potato chips on oh. our first tour day. Do you remember? <laughs> Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. And I oh. was like, oh, haggis, I'm not even sure I want haggis, much less haggis potato chips. <laughs> and they were, because it's, I think it's a spicy sausage. They use a lot of yeah. black pepper in it. Yeah, a lot of black pepper. Yeah, that's the dominant And so Spice. it was like black pepper. It was like a cracked pepper potato chip. 
but they called it haggis and so they probably sold more yeah i think that one doesn't have any actual haggis in it just the spices <laughs> it's i think it's suitable for vegetarians so, uh, <laughs> so steak steak pie um anything kind of in the pub yeah we have a, a great fish we use haddock for fish and chips generally yeah. which is different um i think ireland they have hake england uses cod ours is haddock salmon um seafood goodness oysters mussels um we have all that um all the fish <laughs> and you guys are big game eaters yeah, particularly in the Highlands, a lot of pubs will have like game pie, venison pie. Um, yeah, you could find that um, probably a bit more common up in the north than the south um, of Scotland. But uh, yeah, we have, you know, we're well known for our, our, our beef, our fish, um, all of that. Uh, the lamb. The lamb, of course. Yeah. Yeah. The haggis and uh, the roast lamb. My favorite burger in Scotland oh. was a burger I would never try at home. And, that, and isn't that what travel does to you, is it makes you try things you would never do at home. And it was a venison burger with haggis oh, on it. Oh, that sounds delicious. Yeah, it was at the Ben Nevis Inn. Oh, I love the Ben Nevis Inn. Oh, oh the Ben Nevis Inn and, and, and the Clack Egg are two of my favorite pubs up that way. One of the uh, amazing things is how much your mind can be opened when you travel. New, new experiences, new things you learn about yourself, about others. Um, it's such a privilege and, and, you know, to be able to travel and to have these experiences, you know, it's, it's really enriched uh, my life. So, yeah, in some ways travel could be an investment in yourself, I really feel, and uh, yeah, and it's an honour to be able to share that, like I say, with people often whom it's their first time ever abroad. You know, it's quite amazing. with the bridge the stop and be safe oh rest and be thankful and be <laughs> I mean stop and be safe <laughs> they've had a number of landslides there so yeah I suppose stop and be safe rest and be thankful um, same thing <laughs>